We're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Mari. And here on The Spicy Life, we have a special episode for you today. We are going to talk about loving at a higher level of consciousness. And so to join in on the conversation, we have Chloe Balator, and she's the founder of Chloe's Consciousness Training, a program in behavioral changes that helps people fall in love and stay in love. She runs several workshops a year and a monthly women's group based on this transformational psychoanalytic work derived from Freud, Jung, Eric Burney, and Pat Allen. She does private sessions for women, men, and couples and is the author of the forthcoming book, How to Live. She has been married for 20 years and is a graduate of Princeton University. Rounds of applause. The crowd goes wild. Okay, Chloe, did I mispronounce any of those names? Is um, it well, my name's Chloe Bellatore. <laughs> and it's Eric Byrne and it's Young, Carl Young. Okay, just I but pretty good. Okay, I was I was trying here. I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the Spicy Life Show. Super excited to have you on. I love when I connect with other brilliant minds. And so uh, the way that I usually start off the show is by doing some spice breakers to warm you up. Okay. And get the conversation going. And most people don't know that spicy stands for self, passion, intimacy, communication, and learning to say yes. And so you're going to start off with our spice breakers answering the first one, self. When did you first fall in love with self? Um, I think it's a daily process. I think it's something that, you know, you have to kind of reinvest in every day because most of us have been traumatized as children. And so we have to, you know, unconditional, like loving yourself is loving yourself unconditionally. That means you accept yourself. It doesn't mean you think you're perfect or you make no mistakes, but it does mean that if you do make a mistake, you're okay. Right? You don't mm -hmm. stop loving yourself. A lot of us were raised with a conditional form of love where if you make a mistake, then love will be taken from you. Um, and so I was def I'm definitely in that category. And so I've definitely had to work at fostering my own self love and not punishing myself or flagellating myself because I make a mistake. Or um, So yeah, I reinvest in that daily. <laughs> <laughs> Give me like a defining moment you and you were like, ooh, I need more self-love though in this moment. Um, I think when I started working with Dr. Pat, um, mm -hmm. well, when I walked in her door, I was really skeptical because I've had a lot of therapy, been to therapy, and I always felt like it was kind of a circular process and I wasn't really getting anything out of it. So I was really hesitant to go to Dr. Pat, but my neighbor started a woman's group and I had seen a huge transformation in her. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I'd give it a shot. And when I went in and I sat down in the, what she calls the hot seat, which is like when you work with her in front of the group, um, she nailed me in like five minutes. Love it. She saw me. And the feeling of being seen like that, um, really enabled me to connect to my own authenticity and it was scary but at the same time it's like once you find that you never want to let it go right I completely so that, there yeah. was that moment like five minutes in where I was like holy shit I'm gonna have to listen to what this woman has to say because she sees me um beautiful and that kind of started me on this journey really uh, I love that okay you're gonna have to now tell us about passion when did you discover your life's passion was it at that moment that you were like, this is for me, I need to not teach people? When did you discover that this was? No, no, no. I think as a really young child, I have always had like a really passion-driven life. And it wasn't um, maybe as specific as it is now. But when I was young, I was an abused child. And I knew, I didn't fully grasp the situation I was in, but I knew it was a bad situation. <laughs> and I felt really strongly like in those moments I can remember um, thinking I have got to get out in the world and say my message because this stuff is not okay. Like mm -hmm. people can't talk to people like this. We can't be treating each other like this. And so from a really young age, I've had this like purpose driven life where it, I wasn't exactly sure there was a time where I thought I might be a lawyer. And I mentioned earlier, I'm also a writer. Um, when I found this work, I saw I had, um, 
a really good opportunity to help people. And I was also really good at it. Um, I picked up on it really fast. And then there was a moment where Dr. Pat told me, you are the best person to carry on this work. Mm. So um, it didn't surprise me, but it did. I was flattered by it and I did take it seriously. So the torch was handed to you. Yeah. Yeah. And she's, you know, she's like 86 now. So if people like me don't do this, this work could be lost. And I definitely don't want that to happen. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's beautiful. Okay. Now you're going to get a little close and personal with us. The I is for intimacy and spicy. So you have to tell us what is your physical turn on? What gets your juices flowing? Um, I think kindness really. <laughs> kindness with strength is so compelling when you see um a man who's you know masculine has is controlling has um a strong point of view but that is also able to bring that compassion and kindness to it yeah. like isn't a, isn't a dick but is like using all that in service of um like a higher purpose it's so compelling to me that's and intelligence too. Those the, that combination really gets me going. Like if someone can teach me something, I'm like, yes, bring it. It's <laughs> <laughs> can be kind of unexplained, but um, yeah, I think that that it's all about energy, really. No, for sure. Um, you know, I've been attracted to men who were gorgeous, like we all have. <laughs> and I'm a who like I've had my friends be like gross you know <laughs> and even my husband I think he's gorgeous but you know some of my friends think wow he's really hot some of my friends are like eh. right you but you, all that matters is what you think right mm -hmm. and, exactly and his, the energy in his personality his character makes him 20 times more sexier to you yeah and as people grow and change like we've been together 20 years so we've gone through a few changes, you know, and transformations together. And um, he's just gotten more and more sexy to me. He's, very, he's a very sexy guy. I think it just intrinsically people are like, okay, he's a sexy guy. I'm excited <laughs> to hear the transformations you guys went together. Uh, you have to tell me now, C for communication. Now, what's the best compliment you've ever received? Mm, well, I think the best compliments are specific ones. My husband, when we first met, we had, we worked together. So we decided like we would show up early at work to talk about our relationship or like, it wasn't a relationship yet, but like, what we're <laughs> so I got up early, it was like 6am. And I remember I told him a whole bunch of things of like what I liked about him. And, you know, like I was telling him how I kind of liked his, like, he has this kind of like Humphrey Bogart, like strong, but compassionate thing going. And, um, you know, I probably talked for like 10, 15 minutes and he was like, I like the way your lip curves up on one side. Ooh. And it was so specific. That was like pretty much all he said. I know he likes more than that about me, but it was so specific and it showed me that he was looking at me so closely mm -hmm. that it, it was a huge turn on. I had another guy once tell me um, that um, you're beautiful but your left side is especially beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> your left profile. <laughs> so of course, like, oh, I was always like, um, but that also was a really big turn on because I was like, oh my God, the, he's studying me, you yeah. know, like he's really looking at me. So, and for some people that would make them self-conscious for other people were like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> right now I feel so exposed. I'm like, hmm, let me, <laughs> you start walking up to him like from the side <laughs> like, don't let me sit there <laughs> okay now you have to give us yes and yes is you you know saying yes to the universe yes to the world tell us a time when you conquered a fear when i confronted a fear you conquered the fear you confronted oh, the fear, fear. Yes. oh i mean so many times you know, I think when you're raised in a, in a household with a lot of trauma, one of the byproducts is fear. And when you, and when you suffer from childhood PTSD, you have fear about things that are really disproportionate and out of context. Um, 
so yeah i mean i've had fear i've had fear about very very small things you know um i had a really big fear of going to soul cycle and adjusting my bike what i know it's crazy but it's just like um one of the things that i've been really afraid of is asking people for help mm. so i was really just really nervous of asking someone for help and and doing all that um i think showing vulnerability is also really triggering for me. I've gotten so much better at it. Um, but it's kind of in those small moments that I really notice it. I've had really big fears, of course, too. Like um, I once performed stand-up comedy and that was incredibly... Oh, I that. <laughs> and I did an improv show, which is incredibly terrifying. And those are like kind of big examples. I remember being really scared when... I started Princeton because I thought maybe I wasn't smart enough mm -hmm. um, and they made a mistake. Um, and I was afraid when I got married too. I thought I didn't have as, I mean, it was, you know, 20 years ago, I didn't have the self-confidence that I've built now. And um, I think it's interesting. I think fear has less to do with, the circumstance mm -hmm. and it has more to do with your internal processes mm -hmm. um because i can get very fearful about very little um so it's really about um investing in the moment and acting anyway for yep. me you know it's like okay that's fair you can't you know one of the things this work teaches us is that you can't argue with a feeling you know feelings are there but you don't have to act on them so it's more about acknowledging the fear and just not letting it be in charge and just going through with your day or whatever it is anyways. You know, just go, oh, shit, I'm really fearful about that. Oh, well. And just carrying on anyways. And I find that it's, um, it's so gratifying when you do that and when you get through it. Like, you really feel like you've done something. And I do believe, like, each time I do that, you know, even with, like, the small thing with the Soul Cycle bike, it's like, you know, I built the confidence. I can feel like I moved up a level. Um, and it gets easier. You know, it's it's gradual. Now you're exercising better, too, because you adjusted it. <laughs> right. You took the ones down, the physical benefits and the confidence. Right, right. But for those who are struggling with, because um, you touched on acknowledging that you are experiencing fear in that moment, some people experience the fear and it's debilitating right? They are stuck. They can't just acknowledge it and act anyways. Mm -hmm. What advice of encouragement do you have in those moments where you do feel frozen and you're struggling with the fight or flight concept? Um, I do think it's really useful to just stop for a minute and just like let it wash over you, you know, in a way lean into it. Don't try to resist it or avoid it because that just gives it more power. Um, and I think it's unavoidable and to some degree it does help if you do talk back to it a, a bit, you know, if you're like, you know, the people that work there are there to help you and it doesn't really matter if they think you're stupid yeah. and everybody has a first time and it's okay to ask questions. I mean, to a certain degree you do have to recognize, I mean, for the most part when you're having, um, a lot of fear in the moment it's mostly not about that moment mm -hmm. it's really a trigger for something that happened in your childhood right, right? Yeah. as Freud said your life happens from 0 to 12 and then the rest of your life is <laughs> trying to get over it um, because that period of time is you know the critical period it has so much more power and has so much more valence than the rest of your life um, one thing that I find comforting sometimes is to think, well, it's not going to be as bad as it was then, right? Because yeah. when you're a child, you really, you're really powerless. The problem is when you're a child, you form as a coping strategy existential beliefs to survive what you're going through. And those aren't actually true as you get older. And those things aren't really ever going to happen again. Being a child is a very unique experience. Um, yet we repeat that over and over again in our lives. And that repetition itself is familiar, even if it doesn't bring us joy. So breaking that takes a lot of consciousness, hence my consciousness training. 
Um, and so bringing as, just bringing as much awareness to it as you can. Maybe you can't act, but then don't react. You know, don't do something negative. If you, if you can't do something positive or you can't think positively, just, just try to let it flow over you and maybe not think at all. You know, um, I use meditation, I use breath work, I go in nature, I exercise. Um, I try to find things every day. I have a, a tool that I use called the Lyman where I really try every day to find at least an hour of something that will bring me just pure joy, which has no end in itself. Yeah. One, um, one thing that comes up, and I want to ask you directly about that, because you're giving some great advice right now. These are some nuggets, some gems, some spicy tips that you're actually giving on conquering fear. If someone is feeling anxious, and uh, we're going to use this example specifically, because I get this question a lot. Uh, say the gentleman's not texting back, or the female's not texting back. Their imagination starts to run wild. Mm. They want to react because emotions are telling them fear, concern, uh, maybe potentially rejection is going on. They want to start blowing up their phone or reaching out. We're just using this as an example. So self-destructive. Right. You're saying in that moment, pause. Yes. Take a beat. Let's acknowledge what this is that we're feeling. Is it really what that other person is doing or is it more about what past experiences have you know told us uh when someone doesn't communicate and then you're also saying you could potentially meditate in that moment or um what i like to do or what i tell or advise my clients to do as well is uh, pros and cons what's the outcome <laughs> mm -hmm. of uh this if we do react this way what's the pros what's the cons and is it in alignment with our goal Right. Well, I have some pretty strict rules, actually. You what? Um, first of all, if you're the woman, you don't reach out first, okay? You're being courted. You're the egg. The sperm has to run to you. Now, of course, there's the drive to want to reach out because um, we'd rather sometimes control something and destroy it than have to deal with the anxiety of the unknown. Right. The idea behind anxiety is that we, we're, it's a fear of the future. So if we can control it and wreck it, then that fear is going to go away. But obviously that's not in the service of, that's a hedonistic move, right? That's not in the service of our long-term goals, especially if you want to be in a relationship with somebody. Um, so a lot of times we talk about sitting on your hands because um, you have to be able to go through that moment without reacting, right? It takes extraordinary courage to be able to feel fear and not reach for something, be it alcohol or a behavior, you know, um, or any kind of drug, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to just go through that moment. Um, the way that I teach courting is you wait he's got eight weeks eight weeks is the time that it typically takes and this has been studied by mm -hmm. maxwell maltz and other psychotherapists and psychiatrists but eight weeks is typically the rumination time that it takes from the heart to the head and, and back and forth okay so from your last contact he's got eight weeks to reach out to you so you know one of the attributes of being feminine is being patient mm -hmm. Passive, patient, and vulnerable is what we talk about. The man is competitive, conquering, and controlling. Okay? So if you're being patient, you're not going to be reaching out. And this is really hard. It's surprisingly hard because when you're not, when the guy's not reaching out, it's triggering feelings of abandonment, mm -hmm. right? It's over. And that's so, more often than not, is not the case. But then women reach out and then you scare the guy off and then that's over and you have to start over with somebody else, right? So I really, really teach women to sit on their hands and just not to do it. Okay, if you have to reach out, reach out to me. We also have a woman's group. Reach out to another girl in the group. Sometimes reaching out to your friends isn't the best idea because they have bad advice. <laughs> you know? They may mean well. Like but advice from your friends. <laughs> But they're not trained in this work, you know? If your friend's not in an amazing, incredible relationship that you respect and that you are dying to have, 
what makes you think that they're going to give you the healthiest of advice if they haven't been able to create that for themselves or, and they're not professionally trained, correct? Yeah. So I tell, I do tell a lot of girls don't listen to your friends because mm-hmm. they may mean well, but they don't know this work. Um, and you know, when you sit back and you're the feminine, then you allow the man to be masculine. Right. I mean, so many women complain that they're in a relationship with a pussy, like, right. They're like, he's just so feminine and he doesn't take initiative. And he, well, that's cause you're not letting room for him to control anything. If you step in first, where does he get to do his thing? Mm-hmm. And it's really kind of a deeply spiritual process too, because it's, it's also letting the universe work for you, right? It's also letting the divine kind of intervene and set things up for you. Um, things usually work slower than the way that we want them to. Um, so it takes a lot of power and confidence and trust to receive and to sit back and wait, right? But that's what I teach. And if you feel anxious, yeah, use your anxiety, you know, coping mechanisms. Go, you know, take deep breaths, go on a walk. um, (laughs) um, You know, do the things that make you feel good, but don't reach out to him and wreck it. Then you're going to be starting at back at zero, you know? People don't understand why the reaching out part is going to wreck it. So In that moment, uh, and this is, like I told you, something that comes up all the time, there's a lack of communication. They've established a relationship. Maybe they're even sleeping together. He has stopped communicating. You're saying still do not reach out. Wait for him. Well, okay. First of all, I don't think, um, I teach no intercourse until you do have a commitment. Thank you. Yeah. By intercourse, I'm including... Blow jobs, okay? <laughs> Including orally, <laughs> anally, or vaginally until you guys have negotiated the relationship. Thank I have no so problem with casual sex. But know what you're getting into. You're going to be bonded to this guy for up to two years and you don't even know if he's good for you, okay? And I tell men the same thing. Don't play with women. Don't lead them on. Don't make them think that there's a possible of a relationship when you know it's only going to be for one night. So first of all, you know, don't have intercourse until you've negotiated the relationship. When he wants in, that's the time you have leverage to negotiate, right? Um, I'm agreeing. Now, if he's courting you and you're dating and you haven't had intercourse or you have either way, um, yes, it feels bad when he um, doesn't reach out. Of course, I completely understand that. That feeling's not going to be solved by you reaching out. Because even if you reach out, he still hasn't reached out, right? (laughs) And then you're setting up a dynamic where you're the instigator and you're acting like the sperm. You're acting like the man. If you want to be feminine in your relationship, you have to be patient. But that is opposite of the dynamic of if he is not sitting in his masculine energy and she is in her masculine energy it, it would it would actually flip and she would be dominating or leading the relationship. Most of us women don't want that, right? Most of us want him to be the leader. Right, but I have no problem with that. If, he, if she wants to be the masculine one and she wants to reach out and, you know, I, I always say you either want to get paid or you want to get laid. <laughs> if you want to get laid, reach out, control it. Competitive conquering and controlling. You're the masculine energy. Get a find a feminine men. There's tons of them out here in LA. Tons. But I hate the the connotation that if we say feminine men, that they automatically assume that he is not manly or that he is not masculine. Can you break down uh, masculine energy and feminine energy in the way that we're using it right now? As opposed to saying, we automatically assume if we say that he has more of a feminine energy, that he's a girly girl because feminine and the word masculine have these, you know, two different connotations with them. Right. And a lot of people don't really understand what feminine and masculine means. Like a lot of people think, oh, feminine, it's nails and hair. And, (laughs) you know, I like fairies or, you know, that's not what I mean. So feminine, passive, patient, and vulnerable. You're the receiving. Okay. Masculine, competitive, conquering, and controlling. He's the caretaker. He's the one giving. When you're a mother, you're actually in your masculine because you're the one nurturing and caretaking. 
Um, if you're trying to get both, you're a narcissist. And then you have to be in a relationship with somebody who, who wants to be a zero. That's a codependent relationship, and I don't actually teach that kind of relationship. But people who want that, they have it, they enjoy it, have at it. I, have no, I don't make any value judgments on that. But what I teach is complementary communication. Because when you have two masculine energies, you're setting up for a conflict. That doesn't work in the long term. And if you have two feminine energies, same thing. It's still a conflict. My feelings, I feel bad, I feel bad, well, I feel bad. The hierarchy is so that you avoid conflict. And what, what we really strive for is equity. Mm -hmm. it's, not ex it's not equality because you're not exactly the same. Equality is great at work, and we're all masculine yeah. at work, and the Women's Live movement has been mostly about equality. Yeah. Um, however, that's an economic movement. It's not a psychological movement. Um, and unfortunately, it's been kind of taken into the psychological arena. Um, what we want in our relationships really is to leave our balls at the door. Yep. And to be feminine. And in order to do that, we have to give up control, right? It's okay to ha let a man have control if he cherishes your feelings, right? If he's not cherishing of your feelings, then it's, a, we have, it's really easy. This, that's why I love this protocol. It's so easy to see it. He's out. He's gone. If he's trying to get you to cherish and respect him at the same time, and you don't want to be a zero, He's gone. And so I love this, these tools because there's no like, well, maybe he'll change. Well, things are better now. Well, they were bad then. Well, maybe they'll get better. It takes out a lot of that ambiguity, you know, because ultimately you only know how much you love yourself or anyone else by the commitments you're willing to make and keep. And if you run all your relationships through that, it takes a lot of the guesswork out. Yeah. Absolutely. And so when it comes to the male and female energy, uh, you teach equality and the balance, right? And I think that is extremely, extremely important. Earlier, we had mentioned uh, being conscious. Please clarify what consciousness is. I talk about this a lot on the show. I'd love to hear everybody's input on this. Okay. Please give me your interpretation of consciousness and how important is it when it comes to a relationship? Okay, so we're all feminine and masculine. Carl Jung defined consciousness as the balance of feminine and masculine. And that's, I agree with that. That's what I believe. It's, um, or it's not even what I believe. I mean, there's science to back this up, right? Yes. There's um, scientists who have experimented on newts and the brain and so there's a right lobe of the brain and a left lobe of the brain so we know that everybody has these two parts in them they're just at a different balance in everybody and they're at a different balance in every relationship so consciousness is having that balance that's right for you inside yourself in all of your relationships and in each of your communications that's what i see as consciousness you know bringing bringing that awareness to every, what Eric Byrne calls transaction, which is basically any, any communication between two people. And there's several, there's several levels of awareness, several levels of consciousness. I am under the belief that you love at your level of consciousness. So if you can elevate it, you can also elevate what you attract, elevate the type of partner that you end up with, and even elevate conflict resolution, uh, because now you are operating from a heightened place of awareness. Mm -hmm. What are some things that you recommend that someone can do if they're attracting a certain type or they are um, not understanding, you know, why they keep getting, you know, the person who keeps abandoning them or leaving them. Uh, they're not aware of some of the patterns that they're creating. Right. So this comes, this goes back to this, a topic called scripting, which is, um, believe a term that's coined by Eric Byrne and Claude Steiner. And we're all scripted from our childhoods. Uh, I touched on this a little bit earlier. 
based on the trauma that we went through and the existential conclusions that we made from that trauma. Now, the repetition compulsion is the strongest impulse in everyone, okay? It's stronger than love. So we are absolutely doomed to repeat our childhood history unless we bring awareness or consciousness to it. Um, you know, you can attract all kinds of people, but the people you choose are typically, if you don't have awareness, are going to typically be people who fulfill the roles of your childhood scripting. So if your father abandoned you, you're going to look for a man who was like your father and try to get him not to abandon you, which right. you and I talking can see that's a losing proposition, right? <laughs> you need to pick someone else. But without awareness around it, and you have to, like you said, you have to have pretty deep awareness around it because the repetition compulsion is so strong. So the tools that we use, and that's, again, why I love these tools, and they're so simple, yet they're so profound. But when you have a conflict come up with your partner, let's say, you know, I'm the woman, you make I statements and you lead with your feelings. Mm -hmm. So you say, you first you make an appointment with a man. You never go into a man like, da 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 without making an appointment. Okay? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I... No, this is you are dropping gems right now. You guys are listening to this. She is giving you some spaces right here because the over the just we will jump right in and tell you what we're upset about or what's going on, not taking into consideration that he's going to pull back and whoa, whoa, whoa. There's a, a yeah, men right. aren't ready for that, you know. And the women get such a bad rap for being nags and complainers. It's like you have to make an appointment if you want to preach, teach, criticize, complain. Or question okay so and the great thing about making appointments is a lot of times you realize it wasn't worth making an appointment was it so you didn't actually say it you know most of the time we can make our guy right right if it's not a matter of calling a doctor a lawyer a policeman make him right but if you are upset and you do want to make an appointment do so by make him right you mean make him actually like physically right or make him right in the situation right in the situation like for example or, -E or w-r-i-t r-i-g-h-t so he <laughs> allow him to have his thing okay okay he farted at the table you didn't like it your mom was there whatever you are not going to say shit about that in the moment okay mm -hmm. First of all, that's like a human thing. And you're going to shame your guy over that. You're going to put your relationship at risk over that. You have yeah. to really think about whether or not you want to make an appointment. If he does something that is non-cherishing, okay, if he hurts your feelings, if he, um, you know, makes you feel bad, if he shames you, something like that, you make an appointment. So you would say, honey, there's something I want to talk to you about. Um, it's kind of a touchy subject is now it's about what happened in the car last night or whatever. Um, you have to give him like a general idea is now a convenient time or if not now, when hopefully today, cause you don't want to have to sleep on it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, if he cares about you, he's going to allow you to bring that up. If he's like, I don't fucking care what you have to say. Well, <laughs> <laughs> That you're not in a situation with somebody, you know, you're with a narcissist, basically. But ideally, he's like, okay, you know, tell me about now. Or, you know, I'm working now. T can you tell me when I come home tonight or whatever? Okay, so then he, you have him when he comes home, whatever, you have the appointment. So you say, honey, I want to tell you, I really, you had every right to not want to whatever he was doing, but it made me feel bad. That's mm -hmm. also what I mean by making him right but it made me feel bad. And then you see what he has. What do you think about doing it differently? So you appeal to his thoughts. You start with your feelings and you appeal to his thoughts. Okay. So he may say, Hmm, you know, I don't know. Or I think I can do that. Yeah. Or, um, how about I do it this way? If he doesn't have any ideas, then you can say, then you can suggest, okay, well, what do you think about doing it this way? Whatever it is. Um, it sounds then, very much like the, the yes and approach where you're giving him the affirmation, making him yeah. feel acknowledged and respected 
and then going into uh, what your take is on it or what your impression or interpretation, how you felt. And I think that people get caught up at that part when it comes to now I have to share how I felt about it Mm -hmm. because I don't want to be judged or I'm afraid to be vulnerable or I'm afraid to express how I felt uh, because parents didn't teach me how to express my emotions and I haven't been practicing them in my previous relationship. So now I'm in this relationship and I want to get my point across, but I don't know how. So I love that you're giving um, great communication tips right now when speaking to your partner because communication is usually the number one breakdown. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, most relationships break down and most misunderstandings are based on communication and that's what we focus on. Um, What about the person who doesn't have the self-regulation though and they are used to addressing confrontation head on when they are upset or when something happens to them, they're used to reacting because maybe they are marrying, you know, parent behaviors and they've played this over and over the instant reaction and, you know, saying exactly right there on the spot. How do you comfort them to not feel passive in that moment and to actually feel empowered by waiting? Well, I mean, like I said, waiting really does take a lot of confidence and it is a very powerful position because you have that confidence to wait and see what will happen. Um, you can react, you know, react all you want, but there's a price tag for that. If you're going to react, then he's going to react, then you're going to have a fight. Okay. So is that what you want long-term? You know, we, I, what I try to teach is the long-term goals, not the short-term goals, right? It's stoicism, not hedonism. Mm -hmm. So you can react any way you want, but for every behavior that you take, there's either a prize or a price tag. There's a prize if you're going to wait. There's a prize if you're going to use this conscious communication and show respect to your man. I mean, so much violence towards women is the result of a man feeling disrespected. You know, I mean, we worry about men killing us. They worry about us laughing at them. I know. That is no joke. That is like an equal statement there. Different extremes. I was having this conversation about it the other day, like the fact that they are afraid of us laughing at them and we're afraid of, I'm killing us, but it shows up too when it comes to the dating apps right now. Our biggest, you know, their biggest fear is that we are not going to look like our pictures when it comes to dating mm-hmm. online. <laughs> Ours is that he's going to be a serial killer. That's an extremely <laughs> drastic difference in our dating approach, right? And just the energy that we're bringing. We're starting off it with fear. They're starting it off with, I mean, you know, a superficial element. But that's crazy how we're on two different ends of the spectrum. In our right. But that's how men feel when they're disrespected. You know, that is, I mean, that's what that provokes. When you disrespect a man, you provoke violence. Mm-hmm. So you do that at your own risk, really. I mean. Interesting. So, so many people would argue with you on that, um, saying, you know, a man doesn't have a right to, you know, clap back or to express anger back or to lash out or even, you know, put their hands on you. Uh, I agree. They don't have a right, but those things they happen. Don't. And they do. And you have to take accountability for your behavior and that reaction. And I know this is a controversial topic. Um, I come from a background where, you know, a family where my mother was abused. I've experienced, you know, crazy relationships. And to think that we had any role to play in someone lashing out uh, is seen sometimes as criminal, right? Mm-hmm. Because we are always supposed to be in this place of men cannot touch women. But I also come from a place, and this is my belief, that women should also not be putting their hands on men. We should also be very careful in how we treat one another. And if you treat kindness with kindness, you receive kindness versus <laughs> the lashing out part. Yeah, and when you undermine someone and you disrespect them, that is a form of violence. You know, it's violence isn't only physical, you know, right. and those of us who've suffered emotional and physical abuse will tell you that, you know, often the physical abuse is a lot easier to take than the emotional. Oh my gosh. Yes. You're hitting on some sore spots. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I come from an abusive family and I too would ask, you know, can you just hit me instead of yelling at me? Like right. asking for my punishment to be delivered physically versus verbally because the verbally was so hurtful. Right. And then those voices get in your head Mm -hmm. and then it doesn't matter what relationship you're in or what circumstance you're in, because those voices are inside of you. 
you know, a tame animal will um, answer to his master's call, right? Yeah. Human animals are, human children are the tamest animals of all, okay? Like, <laughs> they don't even have to be talking to us anymore. We have their voice in, their, in our heads. Yep. And that takes conscious work to get that out. So we don't want to reinforce whatever the crap that the, their mother did on them, right? We don't, want, <laughs> we don't want to carry on her work. Oh, my gosh. We just want to be someone different. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Like, women spend so much time on their appearance. But using these tools really shifts your energy. Mm -hmm. And it has such a profound effect. I've seen... Um, Maybe I mentioned this before, but I've seen, you know, Pat's 86, her boyfriend's 65, okay? It really gives you an, un I know, but it gives you an unfair advantage. It really does, knowing this work. Because when she goes after a guy, she's really in her feminine. And when she, even when she's in a public place, if she were to have a conflict with a man, and she thought it was, you, you know, consciousness is really using your feminine and masculine sides at will, right? Yeah. Um, and she were to really use her feminine side, I mean, men will just fall at her, their, her feet to help her. You know, she's not some like beauty queen, but because she can really employ her feminine side, she gets, she can get a man to do whatever she wants for her. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I'm not going to discredit though, the fact that your upkeep and your self care when it comes to the beauty side is important because you still want to present, but you are a thousand times more empowered when the internal is together. Yeah, I mean, you have the tools. You can do as much beauty as you want, and if you don't have the tools, you're not gonna go anywhere. Exactly, <laughs> you, exactly. You know, often, you <laughs> often you see like really hot, amazing guys, and you see the girl they're with, and you're like, hmm, how did she get him, right? And it's the energy. It's totally the energy, and I'll give you an example. Um, when I started doing this work, I was about nine months in and when I realized that my relationship with my mother was ruining my marriage, okay? I was like, at that time I had been married about a little over 10 years. And um, I started doing this work and I started to become more feminine and literally people were like, what did you change? What did you do? I had one moment where, which was very dramatic, where I cherished my feelings to my mother and she didn't respond well, which is her prerogative. But just doing that, taking that autonomous action was huge for me. Yeah. And I woke up because I knew I risked her love in that moment because I knew, the, I knew what the price tag of that was going to be, which is why I had never done it or had only done half measures. I woke up the next morning. I swear to God, the the stress roll of fat around my I had like around my stomach like this little roll of fat yeah. under my stomach where um, women tend to get fat, like the muffin top or yeah. whatever. It was gone. It was wow. gone. People were like, "What the hell happened? Did you go on a diet? Did you been working out?" I was like, "No, I had a breakthrough in therapy." <laughs> <laughs> And that was amazing to me. Very hard though, Chloe, for people to have because they fear damaging the relationship with their parent by being honest. Mm -hmm. And they also fear that what if I have this conversation and she doesn't change, right? And the reason I say she is because it's usually a conversation with our, our mother. What I find, I thought that it, I would be getting all these women, you know, coming to the spicy life that were struggling with daddy issues there's actually more women and men who come in with mommy because mommy was there. Mommy left even a more stronger impression because you dealt with her on a day-to-day -day basis. But it's very hard for them to have that conversation because they're scared of that dynamic shift of mom not accepting what it is that they have to say and not being heard and seen once again, the way that they were in their childhood. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for that fear of that conversation when mom says, nope, I didn't make any mistakes, right? Because it's not always the like, oh, yes, I'm going to take accountability for how I raised you. <laughs> right. What advice do you have for them who are well, afraid of yeah. that? One of the things about these tools is it's not that you always hear what you want to hear, but you will hear the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it just, you have to make that commitment to truth. Um, one thing I say is if you don't 
want to hurt others, then you're going to have to hurt yourself. Mm. So it's part of cherishing your feelings first and putting yourself first. You're going to have to take that risk if you want to be your authentic self. Yeah. If you just want to be your mom's slave, then don't say it. <laughs> don't say it. But if you want freedom and you want to be you, you're going to have to have that moment Bring with your mother and have risk losing her love. You're going to have to risk going it all alone. And that's what's really meant by cherishing your own feelings and respecting your own thoughts first. No. Is standing up for yourself in that way. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, it's important that you also get some, I mean, it's therapeutic, right? To have that conversation, but also you probably have been having the conversation in your head for a very long time and just mm -hmm. not having it out loud with them. And so some of that, you know, some of the therapy comes from the expressing yourself, but then also from how it's a behavioral change afterwards that now that you release, because you, you know, you've released that tension. Now you can, it's just an example of you practicing having better communication by, you know, one of your biggest fears talking to, you know, your parents. But what I want to know is you said that you um, got this training and you, you know, started this um, uh, practice after you had your revelations and your coaching experience. How did you enter into your relationship or you didn't have all the tools when you first started right. your relationship? What was that dynamic and what was that shift from not having the tools and entering into a marriage and then getting the tools? What shifts did you see in your marriage? Well, you know, I can, a lot of people come to this work because they want to get married. Um, I came to this work because I wanted to stay married. I had already been married for 10 years. And I didn't, like I said, I didn't know that it, this was ruining my relationship with my husband, but my relationship with my mother was ruining my relationship with my husband. So I was really in a situation where I had to choose. And I had to choose between all the work that I was doing on myself and my relationship and my career versus my relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. And it was still a hard choice, right? Um, when I made the choice and I did made that first phone call and did that for the first series of actions where I put myself first, it was, you know, it was one of the biggest, it was, it was revolutionary for me. It was like a rebirth. It must be like how born against me. <laughs> When they get saved, yes. Yeah. Um, it was like my birth night. Okay, it wasn't my birthday, but it was my birth night, let's say. Um, and everything shifted. Everything changed. Not just my relationship with my husband, but all my relationships. My friendships, my, my relationship to my work, my work itself. I was in a situation at that time where um, someone was suing me for plagiarism and it was totally false, but they had a lot more resources than I did. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to flip that with this, with this work and with these tools and by flipping my energy. Um, like I said, it's all about energy. So little of it is about like the actual circumstance. When you change your energy, suddenly things start lining up like with very minimal effort, yeah. you know? Um, so yeah, it was life changing. It was absolutely life changing. Um, and what was your husband's response to it? Because sometimes we don't even work on self because we don't want to elevate and potentially lose our partner behind. Right. And there was a moment where I thought that might happen, mm -hmm. but I still had to put myself first. You know, I like I said, I didn't want to lose him, but I went through losing a lot of relationships at that time. Those people I can say now in retrospect weren't really there for me. But each each one felt like a little death. Each one felt like, you know, an abandonment. Yeah. And it was scary. I was really scared. I was like, shit, I'm going to end up all alone? And you kind of have to be willing to risk that for yourself. Um, I was really lucky. Like, it was really hard for him at first to shift the roles and the dynamic between us. Um, but actually men really love this work when they get it. Mm -hmm. um, and he saw that a few times. A lot of times women bring this work to their man because women hold the spiritual energy of the relationship. 
Um, he also saw Pat, though, and we saw her together, but not like ton, you know. I love I, that. So you made him go through the process after you had gone through it? I didn't make him, but um, he was interested in it because that's what happened. He wasn't interested in the beginning. He was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not right. going. In. I'm not. No. I was like, okay, I'm doing it, you know, and I did it. And then for him to understand it, he saw the change in me and he was proud of me. Now, then we had to iron out certain dynamics in our relationship. So then he had to get his own work done, right? He had his own issues. Most people do. <laughs> <laughs> we're all fixers out here. Yeah, but we're also um, coming into the relationship with coming in with our own experiences, our own yeah. upbringing, our own life. Yeah. And he really said, I mean, he honestly said, he's like, I thought the way it had to work was you had to be my mom. Mm. He was like, I thought that's the way relationships worked. I thought you had to be my mom. Was it the dynamic was previously that you were in your masculine energy and you wanted to be in your feminine and that's why you sought out the work to help your relationship and then there was a shift? Did he? Well, start it wasn't that clearly outlined in my mind because I didn't have those tools. Right. What I knew was I was super unhappy about everything. Mm. I actually felt like I was falling in love with somebody else who I didn't even really like that much. Wow. But I was like, why is this happening? Wow. And um, I was very, un I just, I was very unhappy. For most people, you had to hit bottom to be open to change. Um, and that's what really brought me in. I didn't think my career was where it should be. I was, um, Obviously, I was losing interest in my relationship. I was obviously unhappy with my uh, family of origin relationships. Um, I felt I could see I was trapped in a bad cycle. I didn't know how to get out of it myself. I didn't think that it was possible to get out of it because um, I just, I had no, I had some tools, but I didn't have this level. Yeah. Tools. I had some awareness. Um, I had tried to do some work like 10 years before that. And I had tried to separate from my mother at that time. And then I didn't have like the full toolkit to do it. And I ended up going back and then it was worse. So things were just, everything was just worse. Every, just, I was really unhappy. You said a second ago, though, that you were struggling, but you also were open to a different relationship, right? I think oftentimes when we're not happy with ours, we start looking for other people to provide maybe some of those voids. Mm -hmm. And somebody else apparently started to seem more attractive than the relationship mm -hmm. we were in. Once you received though the tools and the training, you started to realize though that that was not the case, that this is not a better candidate than my current partner. It's where my headspace was, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's a, most people will look for external reasons rather than search internally. <laughs> 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 but once I started seeing these tools, <clears throat> first of all, Pat did a really great thing with me, which she, she was like, okay, let's say that's true. You know, let's say that's true. So you're going to break up your family. Mm -hmm. You know, the effect that divorce has on kids. Mm -hmm. um, so she kind of appealed to the stoic part of me. She's like, once your son's 18, leave him. I don't care. You know, but if you leave him before that, then you need to read this book about the effects of divorce on children. Mm. And, um, I found through this process that that wasn't a price I was willing to pay. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the willingness with which my husband took to this work, that was very appealing. And then on top of that, I was going through changes in myself. So my values were shifting somewhat and I started to see how the way I was acting out was super masculine because that's what men do when they have problems, right? They go find another woman. Mm -hmm. um, women usually get fat. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw what bullshit it was 
you know, I really saw it for the bullshit that it was. Mm -hmm. And I started seeing also this other person. I wasn't in contact with him anymore, but I started seeing how he wasn't really any of the things that I wanted in somebody yeah. that it was completely. And this is, this is normal. Like for the first three years, when you are in love, you're falling in love with the projection. You're falling in love with what you think is the missing piece of yourself. And that was exactly, I mean, I could totally see that was exactly what I was doing. Um, and I knew, <clears throat> even in, I think, my darkest moments, I don't think I really wanted to be with this other person, but I just, I didn't have any other way of getting strokes and making myself feel better other than attracting men. That was like just my MO up until that point. I had a bad relationship with my father and my MO was like, I'm going to just show everybody that men love me and men are attracted to me. And that was my only way to get strokes. And so things kind of reached ahead at that point. But even prior to that, I was like a relentless flirt and I was just always, <laughs> you know, just trying to get male attention. Um, even before I was married, I was very into having like more than one guy and, you know, um, and I just started to really see that for what it was, that it had nothing to do with the other guy, that it was all about me and my lack of, you know, it was my lack of, a, my own lack in myself of being able to cherish my feelings and respect my thoughts and get strokes for who I am, as opposed to just getting superficial strokes. See, everybody needs strokes. That's like a natural human desire. Okay. Most transactions are predicated on your desire for strokes, but when we get strokes that aren't good for us, mm -hmm. we can never get enough. Right. And so that was the position that I was in. So it was never enough. I could never get enough men interested in me. I could never be, you know, just that was never, it never made me feel good. It wasn't boosting my self-esteem in a long-term way. It was just a hedonistic, satisfaction ego and when I had the satisfaction like I said of cherishing my feelings to my mom even though it was I was crying and it was triggering and I you know it was very very difficult and I had a lot of physical symptoms from it um the need for those superficial strokes started to go away mm. you know I started like I said I started to see it for the bullshit that it was you know and um it just sort of evaporated. I appreciate you sharing this because I know how, you know, this is your personal life. This is, this is you being extremely vulnerable, but you are potentially saving someone's relationship right now that's hearing this because they too may be struggling with, do I work on relationship or do I seek outside of the relationship for the gratification that I need, that instant gratification. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we hear mostly about men struggling with this. So I think that it's amazing and beautiful to hear that us women struggle with this as well. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we look for, you know, outside validation and attention and that affirmation that we may not be getting at home. And even if we did, it still might not be enough because it's internal. Right. It's not happy. And someone else, we're still, whether we seek someone else to give it to us inside the home or outside of the home, it's still not going to be enough unless we have, we come from within. The, the external is great and we do need a piece of that, but that can't be all of it. Exactly. <laughs> so I really, really appreciate <laughs> sharing this because most people are afraid to admit this. Yeah. But it sounds like once you did, you were able to do, you know, the work on it. And then I think we forget too that you doing self-reflection, you having your own awareness and heightened level of consciousness. Now you're in a position and now you have the tools to guide your partner to come there as well. Oftentimes we just want to leave the partner, mm -hmm. right? You having now these tools can now guide him to the place to where you go, but both are on the same playing field. So you, you know, where you both have the same tools and are able to communicate more effectively. He has more clarity. I think this is beautiful. This is a love story. And this, please tell me this is in your book. <laughs> um, <laughs> Speaking of book. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's touched on. Maybe not to this degree of detail. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, basically, look, we're all fallible human beings, right? You what you commit to is not the person. You commit to the relationship. You commit to the institution of marriage. Mm -hmm. Cuz we all can be shit. And that's in your relationship and the other people out here. It's yeah. like 
one thing that I say a lot, there's no one out here. There's no one. Out here. <laughs> like, you know, we're all shit. It really comes down to whether or not someone's teachable or not. Mm-hmm. Okay. If they're teachable, then you got to stick with it. If they're not, then you can move on. My husband was teachable. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I say that I'm joking. If they're willing. If the person may be wanting, but are they willing to do the work on the relationship? Are they willing to allow you to guide them to gain the tools? So you looked yeah. up because, yes, he was, he was teachable. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, now we're at a place where I really, I could not have ever imagined. You know, a lot of our concepts of romantic love is that first rush and that feeling, and that is so wonderful, and that is unfair. Please speak to that. Okay. You know, I, first of all, I have, I have clients <laughs> who are only interested in that, and that's fine. They date someone for three months, and then they break up with them. Okay. You can just keep having that first rush over and over and over and over again. But if you want to have kids and you want to have a family, you know, the truth is that children thrive in a two parent family. I'm not shitting on single moms. I'm not shitting on divorce. Sometimes you have to get a divorce, but the truth is that children do better in a two parent family. That's just the truth. So if that's what you want, you have to be willing to do what it takes to fulfill that commitment, right? You only know how much you love yourself or anyone else by the commitments you're willing to make and keep. Mm -hmm. After three years of a relationship with anybody, that glow wears off. And then you start to really get to know that person. If you're not willing to do that in general, don't don't have kids. Maybe you can get married, but don't have kids because then you're making your kids pay for your lack of foresight yeah um like i said i have no problem with people who want to be have serial relationships but if you want a long-term relationship you have to be able to get past that point with somebody Mm. you know you do your part and you hope to god that he does his part yeah um because you are going to grow and you are going to change over time you know experts don't tell you what to do they have strategies for coping in difficult times And that's what this work is about, is there strategies for coping in difficult times. Um, So now I'm at a point of intimacy and relationship that I certainly didn't see witnessed as a child, Mm -hmm. that I don't often see out there. I mean, I think on that panel, I was the only person who was married. So Um, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> met Chloe at a panel uh, that uh, we went to at Soho, and um, it was a panel of relationship experts and matchmakers up there. And that was one of my observations: was that it was this group of women who I respect. I will probably bring them on the show to give uh, some tips and tools. But you were the only person who was married who chose. Right love because that's his choice right you chose a partner so i did find that that was interesting that there was only one person up there what, what did you think about that i mean i'm not surprised because most marriages do end in divorce most people you know i mean that's those are the statistics um but i do think it gives my work a little bit more integrity mm-hmm. you know um because i know how to do this yeah so i know i can teach it yeah um and like I said, I've reached a level in my relationship and a level of contentment that I've never, ever thought was possible that I couldn't have e- even imagined. And I don't, um, of course, there's times when I have chemistry for somebody else or I'm attracted to somebody else, but it's not like how it was before. You know, I don't, my husband and I are really on the same page. We don't have a lot of fights. Um, we have really good chemistry, um, which is the thing that you, you know, that's from God that gets you through the hard times. Yeah. You know, that's the one thing you can't work on is the chemistry. We're we like each other. <laughs> yeah. We're attracted to each other. Um, we're compatible. The, you know, the three elements you need are chemistry, compatibility, and communication. So we okay, have that. the same values. We want the same things out of life. We have chemistry. We worked on our communication. I mean, he's gotten so good that sometimes he's just like, well, you're just trying to control me right now. You know, he'll like, <laughs> and our kids are so good at it too. They, they use it because kids, 
this stuff is the truth. So it really resonates for kids. Yeah. You know, um, you know it's based on the ancient concepts of yin and yang. Yep. And um, so our kids use it on it all, use it on us all the time. And it, it's, it's. Dive into that because most people don't know. We hear yin and yang, but most people don't know what we're talking about when we speak about yin, yin and yang in energy. Uh, tell us what that is. Okay, well, there's a great book about it called The Yin and Yang of Life um, by Dr. Lee and Dr. Kim, and it basically breaks down every single thing in the world into yin and yang, like food and drink and like everything. But yin is basically feminine and yang is basically mas masculine. And sometimes I use yin and yang instead of feminine and masculine because feminine and masculine tend to be, like you said, confusing yeah. terms and charged words with like lots of different connotations. Um, so the yin is the receiving and the yang is the giving. The yin is the feminine, the yang is the masculine. Um, and so, you know, my husband, yeah, I mean, <laughs> he points it out when I'm too yang, you know. <laughs> I'm very masculine. I'm in my masculine right now. Yep. You know, every relation, there might be another guy I would be with and I'd be more feminine um, or more masculine. You know, every every relationship is different and relationships change over time. As women get older, they become more masculine and women and men become more feminine. Um, so you really have to use these tools if you want to keep the roles the way that they are or the way that they were. One, one rule that I say is it's fine if you guys want to switch it up a little bit, but <clears throat> whoever starts with the feeling is then taking that feminine role. Mm. And then the person has, the other person has to respond with the masculine you know, has to respond with the thought and vice versa. Yeah. So whoever, if I start with the thought, then my husband will have to take a feeling. So I really try not to do that. I really, I want my feelings cherished most. Yeah. But I can get my thoughts respected at my, at work. Yep. You know, but when I'm home and I'm with my husband, I want my feelings cherished. I don't need him to tell me how smart I am. Right. Okay. I want him to take care of me. <laughs> I don't need him to tell me how smart I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> One of my favorite things that you said right now that I always speak on is the importance of us getting these tools, gaining this consciousness, um, because what the Bible calls is a generational curse is really also a learned behavior that children are going to emulate and mirror from you. So mm -hmm. the fact that you guys now have these tools, you're able to give it to them and they now have a higher and increased chance of having a healthy relationship versus some of us who, and I'm one of them, I was raised in a single parent home. So because I had seen my mother, you know, go from, you know, marriage to marriage, I didn't have the stability of equally balanced masculine and feminine energy in the household, the yin and yang. Mm -hmm. So growing up, similar to many women, all we know is the male energy. All we know is let me lead with masculine. That's how I get what I want. That's how I survive. Mm -hmm. And so then having to learn it as an adult becomes harder because now you have, you have all these years you haven't practiced it. But if you do have those tools, you were able to pass it on to your children and give them a fair shot, a fair. And you said you were like, my kids, you know, are using this all the time. Like it makes so much sense. I'm excited for them and the potential for their relationships. Mm -hmm. It's so it's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It really is. I'm, I am too. I'm so excited. Whoever gets them is so lucky. <laughs> my curse, you know my parents were divorced my husband's parents were divorced now we've broken the the pattern and a lot of times these patterns you know like i said the repetition compulsion is so strong so these patterns go for generations and generations so to have broken that is um you know is really a wonderful thing i i feel so grateful for and um yeah i mean i wish i had these tools in high school i could have like work the guys so much better because <laughs> this is these are you know these are tools of manipulation for women yeah well, men control and women manipulate <laughs> um people people sometimes bump on that but that's the truth you know I like um guiding we guide we guide them <laughs> <laughs> that's my nicer way of saying it so they don't feel bad when they, but i don't want to be manipulative okay fine right but we don't care about men's feelings <laughs> so. 
we're going to guide them. Uh, anything you want to mention about the book that we should know about? Where to find Oh, yeah. So I'm finishing up my book now. And you can contact me through my website if you want to pre-order. It's called How to Live. It outlines the basics of all these tools. It talks about my story. It talks about scripting and childhood. And it's just supposed to be a nutshell of this work um, and something really, really usable that you can refer to over and over again. So my website is chloesconsciousnesstraining.squarespace.com. And my IG is the same, but Chloe's underscore consciousness underscore training. Um, you can also, I'll just give my email too. Yep. Yeah. C K O V N E R at AOL.com. And um, if you're interested, I do sessions and I also do um, a monthly women's group. I do workshops every year. So um, email me, I'll put you on the mailing list, um, or you can book a private. Um, either way, I really work to make myself available for my clients in the moment because like you were pointing out earlier, a lot of times it's like, I want to reach out, I don't know what to do, he said this, blah, blah, blah. So having that service is something that I really um, try to provide. So yeah, everything can be found on the site, chloesconsciousnesstraining.squarespace.com. And I'm going to give that one more time in just a second because I forgot to ask you an important question about mm -hmm. what shift do you see or are you observing with a uh, Corona virus mm -hmm. right now in the dating industry? Like with what's going on, you know, we can't see each other in person right now. Right. Are you seeing any shifts in masculine feminine energy in you know technology what are what are you seeing right now when it comes um to you know there's like everything there's a positive and a negative to it i think one of the positives is that more people are going online and so because i have a lot of clients who are like ah, i don't like anybody online no i should go online well now everybody's online because nobody can really flirt in person unless you're like six feet away and you know you have really good vision and you can see um so there's a lot more people online now. So I do encourage people for this time at least to give it another shot if you haven't. Um, I think the downside of it is that there's, it's a, there's a bit of fear mongering that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And um, of course we know that fear is contagious yep. and it's not conducive to love. Um, and I'm thinking that when this quarantine is over, we're going to see a negative reaction from that fear, which is going to be like Ooh. people like rushing at each other and doing things that ne aren't necessarily, that are more hedonistic, you know, that aren't necessarily in their best interests long-term because we've been like in this fearful state. And then people, become a little bit more desperate, right? Yeah. And when we're desperate and fearful, we, we're not acting from our highest self. We're not acting from a place of self-love. Um, so I'm kind of, I'll see, you know, I'll see if I'm right. That's what kind of what I'm seeing. Um, that's kind of what I'm predicting. Okay, so you're giving this this, this spicy ball prediction. Um, like if you have a crispy ball, I love it. I'm actually going to pay attention because um, it's, you know, something that I'm experiencing a lot too. And as you, you know, as, in this industry, but I am in agreement and wouldn't be shocked or surprised. So I too, I'm telling people take advantage of this time. Mm -hmm. However, let's choose people not from a place of fear, <laughs> yeah. but from love. So I, um, I mean, mainly I, I don't want women to go. What women do a lot is they want TLC and then they give into sex that they know that isn't like the right time, yeah. you know, or intercourse specifically. You can have sex, you can fool around, you can do all that stuff, but not intercourse. So that's my main concern of things happening. I think the pro is that you have time to get to know somebody yeah. in an online setting. And so, you know, there's not the pressure of the dating where he feels like he has to pay for everything. And you feel like you have to put out, like, you know, you can actually get to know somebody. Um, I just want to say that, like, when we are out in the world again, you know, you don't need to ask desperate, you know, let's just, like, go back to using these tools. <laughs> okay, well, pop quiz. You guys have been uh, communicating through one of the apps. You guys then go onto telephone or FaceTime. 
they say they want to meet you in person during this quarantine, do they go yes or no? Um, no, you can't meet during in person right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I don't think I'm fear mongering, but, um, yeah, I think it's too, it's too risky. I mean, unless you're going to have one of those six feet apart deals, you know, but the, like, they're going to come to each other's houses because you can't go to a restaurant. Right. You're putting yourself so, in already a compromising situation when you're first just getting to know someone. <laughs> right. I mean, I think it's a lot. It's, um, like I said, I think it's hard to get to know somebody from a six feet distance. Um, I have seen people, you know, going on walks or whatever and have it maintaining that distance. Um, but I think it's just at this point better to wait. Hopefully it's not going to go on. It's not going to go on forever. If you can't guarantee that they are COVID free and that you're COVID free if you have been tested, you can't guarantee that you're clear. Stay at home and just FaceTime until. <laughs> yeah, this is a good time to work on yourself, you yeah. know. We have tons of tools we can do to work on ourselves. Perfect time. Um, and we can reach out to people. We, we do have all this technology. You know, there's also writing letters and phone calls too, you know. I'm so with it. <laughs> right? the letter. It said you went old school with it, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, Chloe, I love, love, love all of the information that you have given. Once again, tell everyone where they can find you. Okay, Chloe's Consciousness Training .com. That's the best spot. And there's a contact me button right on the site. So, if women's there, they can uh, look for your book. So, yeah, I mean, I don't have all the functionality of making appointments there, but I do have my my email on there. So just contact me. You can pre-order the book. You can contact me for an appointment. Um, you can get some information. Not all the information is on the site, but you can get some information on the site. You can read testimonials. You can read the letter that Dr. Pat gave me, um, her recommendation of my work. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing from you. Beautiful. And you guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my Instagram at spicy Mari. Go to the spicy life.com, download this episode, share it with a friend that really needs to hear it. And there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The spicy life.